Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Kruger. And in front of me are glasses. Ooh, I can feel it tingling all the way down in my plums. <laughs> I had to quote the late well, great Ashley Schaefer. I was in North Carolina, as all you guys know. Uh, I can't remember the last time like we did a family vacation at all. It's been a while. Did a family vacation, and my brother couple months ago two months ago he's texting me he's in like california or something he's with like six or seven other people and they all drink bourbon and they were like let's get let's all chip in everybody does like 30 bucks let's get a real expensive bottle for tonight and everybody gets i think it came out to three ounces so my brother was texting me he was like hey have you ever heard of uh, calumet i'm like I have a bottle of the eight year. It's pretty good. All the other stuff's pretty pricey. Haven't had it unless, you know, somebody gifts me something. And so they went in on the Calumet 16 and bought it. My brother had three ounces, loved it. I guess that made its way into the family text chat. So my mom sees it. We're going on vacation to North Carolina my mom goes out and buys a bottle of Calumet 16 for me and my brother. My brother flew to North Carolina. I drove. It's coming back with me. So, and I also did a little bit of bourbon hunt, bourbon hunting. So there's Calumet 16 and three bourbons that I picked up in North Carolina. This is what I love. He's now saddled. For those of you listening to the audio only version, first of all, watch the video on YouTube. Second of all, he's got four snifters in front of me, and there's a little bit of whiskey in each one of them. A mouthful. And what he's challenged me with is finding out which one is the expensive one. He goes, oh, if, you, he goes, if you're legit and your taste in bourbon is legit, you should be able to pick out which one is the expensive bottle. And I had to respond immediately by going, do you know what I was doing last night? I was drinking $14.99 a bottle old tub straight on the rocks. <laughs> That's what I was doing in my house. I don't know what makes you think I'm refined. When you think Drew Gear, you can think a lot of things. Like, what are some adjectives that come to mind when you think about me? Poor. <laughs> Low credit. Low credit. <laughs> um, mentally weak. <laughs> mentally weak? That's about as all I can... I can... Um, I will say classy will never be one of them. It'll never be an adjective somebody uses to describe me. And so with that said, I'm very interested to see how this goes. Because I, if I know you, there's probably one like bootleg pick in here that's just an absolute bomb that you put in here intentionally. Well, if you need to know the price points of them. So yeah, you'll start go left to right the price points there's the calumet 16 which is like 170 uh there's another one that i bought for 40 another one i bought for 46 and then another one i bought for 65 okay so what i'm gonna do so go left to right and tasting them That is very good. It's very good. It's kind of... There's some heat on the back end of it, but it's it dies down pretty quick. You can drink it neat like this, and it's not... I will say that the flavor of it is kind of... I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess maybe it's just me being a peasant, but I would have expected it to have a little bit more flavor. All right. But it all vanishes from your tongue pretty quickly. So you could, in theory, drink this neat and get from one sip to the next sip to the next sip and experience the kind of, hey, this is really good. 
All right, it's a little hot. What's the proof on that? I'll tell you after you drink. Okay. After we decide which one you like best. This one I can smell the alcohol in. This one has more of an alcohol-forward smell. It's kind of thin. The taste, the flavor of it, definitely don't like it as much as that one. It's a little thin. It, unless it's just this one messed my palate up, this one Well, here, did you take water in between? No, of course not. <laughs> what, do you think I'm a professional? You should be. I think that this one, the flavor faded even quicker than the Calumet. We don't know what one the Calumet is. Well, no, I don't. So whatever that was on the left, this second one here, the flavor on it faded pretty quickly. And it's a little bit of a different color. Okay. On to the third one. On to the third. They all smell kind of the same at this point. I think one of the things I like about bourbons is that bourbons tend to be a little bit thicker. Like, they taste thicker, like a... Viscosity. They have a higher viscosity. Like, when you think about a, a sour mash, like a, like a Jack Daniels versus a Jim Beam, Jack Daniels just feels a little bit thinner. It doesn't have the presence. That felt lighter than the other two. But there's a part of me that almost feels like the, the, the flavor profile doesn't seem to be changing that much, and there's a part of me that almost thinks you're setting me up here. That they're all the same whiskey. And this has become the George Costanza. Like, I'm very paranoid of the George Costanza candy bar lineup where they're all Twix. It's all Twix, all of them. No, they're all they're all different. Last one, down the hatch. I did mark the glasses. Ooh, hang on. Yikes. <laughs> on the nose, I do not like that one. I can already tell you I'm not going to like this. I did mark on all the glasses. They are lettered on the bottom. Nope. That one tastes too much like scotch and rubbing alcohol. Holy shit, what is that? Ah. Do you have a favorite? <laughs> I'm going to chase that with Narragansett. <laughs> That's how bad this is. I'm going to use water from the river <laughs> to wash my mouth out after whatever the hell that was. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite or a guess at what the Calumet is? Because I'll... Whatever you like best, I'm pouring you a glass of. Here's the problem. Well, first of all, can I get rocks with whatever it is you're going to pour me? Also, this was terrible. I don't know what was my favorite, but this was awful. Uh, if, if I could... Like, this was Billy Madison... This whiskey is the equivalent of Billy Madison's answer in that Jeopardy game at the end of the movie. Like, I, this ruined the entire whiskey tasting for me. It's awful. If you had told me, whatever, I don't care which one it is, whatever you paid for that bourbon, you paid too much. Barton's has a better, like, finish than that. This thing smells like you took stump whiskey and put a cigar in it. And then you <laughs> handed it to me, and I drank it. Or or you took a really, like, mediocre whiskey that had a lot of, like, hey, we're trying to be a blended scotch thing, and then you ran it through somebody's gym socks and then put it in a glass for me. I'm what, repulsed by this. Which one is your favorite? It's probably the first one, to be honest, the one all the way on the left. You just went with... I'm going to go to this one because it zooms. You went with... That one, Weldon Mills, Weldon Mills Reserve Bourbon Whiskey, barrel proof, 111 and a half proof, bottle 548, batch 39. It is uh, distilled and bottled in Weldon, North Carolina. You did not pick the, uh, this was, although this was a $65 bourbon. All right. And then B, Calumet 16, look at okay. that. So this was the one that I was like, this is pretty good too. This is the kind of thing that, and now and this then, is what, and this is what, g g give me my single shot here for a second. This is what screws whiskey up for a lot of people. So these two, 
I found them both equally unoffensive kind of nice they had a flavor that kind of registered it hung on your tongue and then it went away and you go well there's a little heat on the back end but it fades pretty quickly and this is kind of nice i can drink this this one that i liked was 65 dollars. chris what's the price point on killing at 16 my mom bought it for 170 at total wine so i could get three bottles of this thing For the same amount as one bottle of this thing, knowing that I actually just enjoy this one better. It makes no sense. Whiskey in and of itself, there obviously there's tiers and there's price points and there's certain places like Chris and I for birthdays. It's a bottle. It's a bottle of whiskey has to be in glass price point 40 bucks, because if you go below 40, you run the risk of getting skunked. At the same time, at a certain point, you almost, you're just spending for vanity. And I feel like that's what screws up whiskey for everybody. Because it makes it feel inaccessible when in reality you can have a lot of fun. I mean, look at Iman and I, Chris. We drink Old Granddad. Yeah. We love it. I was, I told you, I was drinking Old Tub on the rocks last night. I went from making a revolver just to straight whiskey which doing some things we're going to get into here tonight in the podcast. This is what fucks up whiskey for everybody. It's this right here. Now I need to know what the hell was that so I can avoid it like the plague. Well, you're not going to be able to find it here, but this is the third Thank one. Thank God. Third one right here, 13 Colonies from Georgia. Very highly rated uh, bourbon, and you can only get it in the South. Uh, we stopped in Tennessee at a liquor store, and I was like, I'm going to be five minutes or less. I went... I almost, like, I cut through the check. Thank God no one was there. I cut through the checkout line, and because I went in, I was in the vest- vestibule already, lo- I'm five minutes or less, see the wall of bourbon. I almost got distracted because they had, like, five or six store picks, but I went to the wall, and I, I scanned up and down all the way to the wall and back, and then I found that I was out in five minutes. I've You I've intentionally bought wanted, this whiskey. I've, I've wanted to have... 13 colonies now okay so one, hang on hang on hang on here's what i'm going to say about 13 colonies can i have my single shot uh it's your are you which uh letter are you holding it says on the bottom d okay that's last that's you don't know what that one is yet oh uh, boy it's it's 40 bucks frying pan shoals bourbon you probably don't like it. i'll tell you pro- why you probably don't like it because uh I read the fine print when I bought it, but not this fine print. I went. I specifically wanted to get something that was distilled and bottled in North Carolina or somewhere in the South, which this is in Elizabethtown, North Carolina. Single barrel, coastal style, straight bourbon whiskey, 94 proof. Here's probably why you don't like it. Aged three years. Yeah, that's probably why it's so harsh. And here's what, I'll take it one further. I really thought that you were saying that this was the one from Georgia where you're like, oh, they don't sell it up here. I will restart the Civil War if you try selling this shit up here. Right? I will come down there like Sherman if you try selling that stuff up here. That's it. That's all I have to say on the matter. This was a winner. I stand by my pick. All right, I'll get you a glass in a second. Hell yeah. We hit it? Guys, we are here with this week's Bill's News Update. Hard knocks the Buffalo Bills and the 2024 wide receiver train. It is funny, the the show Hard Knocks. The Buffalo Bills have never had to be on it. And I'm really thrilled about that concept, about the fact that we've never had to be a part of a forced reality TV show about our team, because I feel like we've already been subjected to enough embarrassment. As a franchise, we had the like the longest running active playoff drought for so many years. We've already the, the four Super Bowls that we didn't win. We have already been nationally embarrassed enough. I don't think that we need to be a part of this. So I'm really happy that that's not a thing that we have to deal with in our lives. It was funny kind of watching through this initial show that comes out and you get to see some of the stuff that was going on around draft time and some of the conversations that were being had. And one of the first things that I I noticed that the GM of the Giants, Joe Shane, 
was a former Buffalo Bills AGM. So there's a tie here, and I'm not just talking... Because, Chris, everybody gets annoyed when I talk about things that aren't... Like, oh, get to the Bills talk! First of all, I'll see you all in hell. Second of all, um, there's a tie here, and I think it's interesting. It's, that's what we're doing here, right? Talking about things that interest me, because I'm the host. I'm the guy with the microphone. You know, I'll never forget there was a Rodney... Uh, Rodney Dangerfield was doing crowd work at the end of a set, Chris, that had run short, and he had to fill his time. And so the way the story goes... He goes, hey, I've got uh, I've got some extra time. Who's got some questions? Who's got whatever? And some guy in the front row goes, yeah, I got a question. What do you really do for a living? And without breaking a st- without breaking stride, he just goes, hey, hey, you know what I do is I find guys to sleep with your sister down at the bus station. I'm the guy with the microphone. You can't mess with me. I'm the guy with the microphone. You're all here or not here because you either love it or don't. I love you for sticking around, but we do what I feel like doing. And what I feel like doing is talking about hard knocks. Joe Shane looked and looks kind of rough in that early going, because you get to see some of the conversations he's having with his underlings about like the value, like the valuation of Saquon Barkley and the fact that he's arguing with the, like the, the one personnel person and the coach about, well, who's who's gonna pay him? Well, who who's gonna pay Saquon Barkley? He's like literally anybody, Joe. Anybody who has money to spend is going to pay Saquon Barkley. And so just watching that whole, you know, back and forth, and it's interesting knowing that that guy came from our building, because Chris, I think we all want to believe that Brandon Bean is very good at his job, correct? Yeah. And I think there's this thing that happens where you assume that because you came up under a certain person, you're going to be good at doing whatever the job is when you eventually take that person's equivalent job. We we see it a lot with coaching trees in the NFL. I mean, look at the New England Patriots. Bill Belichick's coaching tree. Like, first of all, let's start with the Andy Reid coaching tree. The Andy Reid coaching tree, Chris, if you want to give that a goog for me just from what I know off the top of my head, is pretty, it's pretty stout, right? You've got the, first of all, Sean McDermott. You've got John Harbaugh. Like, they're both successful, highly successful NFL coaches. If you want to scroll down, I think there was a graphic somewhere in here that kind of showed the whole thing. John Harbaugh, who else? Well, Matt Matt Nagy. Matt Nagy. Matt Nagy's back working for him again. We're not going to, Doug Peterson. Super Bowl winner. So he's got two Super Bowl winners. Ron Rivera, Super Bowl head coach. Sean McDermott, Super Bowl defensive coordinator. Todd Bowles, he's been a head coach, I think, now twice. Yep, just getting his uh, next start. Keep scrolling down. Pat Shermer. Leslie Frazier. Heard of the guy. Steve Spagnolo. How many rings does that guy have as a defensive coordinator? A lot. He's not he's not a good head coach. No, but again, if you want to talk about the quality of these coaches and the fact that they cut their teeth before they struck out on their own and eventually went to go do things, the fact that they grew up under Andy Reid speaks to Andy Reid's eye for who is a good coach, how do I cultivate a good coach, and how do I teach them how to take a step somewhere else? Or even if it's not take a step somewhere else, how do I teach them how to be the best at what they're currently doing? Or how do I coach them to hone their abilities? There's a lot to be said about that. Now, Chris, Google the the Bill Belichick coaching tree. I think that you look at all of the failures, the Joe Judges, the Matt Patricias. Who else? Charlie Weiss. How many other failures, right? How many? Who's the fat guy that... Broke his leg for Notre Dame. Charlie Weiss. Charlie Weiss. Uh, is Romeo Crennel? Yes. A uh, Belichick guy. Let's see. T- Judge, Patricia, keep going. Josh McDaniels. Hasn't gone well. Romeo Crennel. Eric Mangini. The Manginius. Brian Dayball. <laughs> it's been up and down. El Gro. Nick Saban. Brian Flores. Bill O'Brien. 
a lot of being fired, not a lot of postseason success, not a lot of success in general. I sometimes wonder, what is the tree going to look like? Because we always talk about how you know the Bills are doing well because people are poaching our front office personnel to build out their own front offices. And so... Only one of his head coaches are above 500. Okay. You know who that is? Any guesses? Who? Al Groh. Al Groh? Because he only coached one season, and he went... (laughs) I think he went uh, nine and yeah nine and seven. Al Groh, awesome. You can't. T- I love that the, on this article it just says you can't tarnish a legacy, a legacy that barely exists. That's epic. That's that's you could just put that on his headstone. You could just put that on El Groh's headstone. In fact, I might put that on my headstone. You can't tarnish a legacy that barely exists. Here's the question: When it comes to front office personnel. Have the people who left Brandon Bean's tutelage gone on to have like rousing success, Chris? I I don't think so. No. I mean, who was the guy who like got to the Houston Texans and then immediately got fired? They talked. There, there was rumblings about some kind of improprieties in the building. Uh, Brian Ganey, I believe it was. The only the only coach that I remember of that. That type of legacy with a team would have been uh, Bobby Petrino with the Falcons, where he quit during his first season and then had to go back to college. Vontae Davis style. Yes. So it's just interesting when you see some of the things happening to these guys. that, And obviously they're getting the job because they're taking over bad franchises. So it's going to be interesting watching. Like That's how I'm choosing to watch Hard Knocks. It's just, I want to see Joe Shane, and I want to see what he has, and what has he learned from Brandon Bean, and is this going to be one of those things where we watch our GM be really good? Is he Bill Belichick? Is Brandon Bean Bill Belichick in the sense that I'm going to be really good at what I do, and I'm going to produce a front office full of guys that you want to poach, but when they come into your building, they're not going to be able to replicate what I do. So you're it's our uh, assistant general manager. Okay. He's our assistant. Brian Joker. Gain. He <laughs> yep. was he was in Houston for a cup of coffee. Yep. January 18 to June 19. So with that said, Brandon Bean himself does have a cameo in the Hard Knocks episode to start the season. And it was just a quick blurb, but it, it was telling. Where he's jokingly, Joe Shane being like, hey, anybody want to trade up into the top 10? And Brandon Bean's like, I don't even have it. I don't have enough draft picks. I I don't know what you're talking about here. I'm missing picks. I got to go do work to get some of this stuff back. I can't. And then he makes a comment about how I can't afford to draft in the top 10. Remember all of the hullabaloo about trading up for a wide receiver? Yes. It was never real. It was never real. Smoke screen. Not smokescreen, it was just never a reality. Our GM didn't talk about it, and everyone's like, well, he's he's lying in the weeds because he doesn't want to tip his hand. No, there was no hand to be tipped. He was being honest with you all. With all of us, he was being dead honest, just going, I'm I'm not trading. I'm, in fact, like, I have, like, we're going to keep our options open, but I'm not, I'm not looking to do that. And he was given an opportunity by a guy he knew to do so and just completely washed his hands and walked away. So all of this talk about trading away picks and doing these things and all the training for the Brandon Ayukes and the T. Higgins of the world and all this stuff that took place. Don't you feel kind of dumb? Like if you're the person who believed in that? Because you go, wait a minute, that was never real. <laughs> and just how easily Brandon Bean looked at another GM who was like, hey, do you want your pick of wide receivers? Maybe even Romo Dunes or Malik Neighbors or any of the like super talented wide receivers in this draft class. And Brandon Bean, it took him less than less than two seconds to go, nah. Nope, not even entertaining that conversation. Doesn't it make you as a fan who spend so much time like trying to overanalyze these things, doesn't it make you feel dumb? Yeah. 
It should. It should. I think that I think that we've been doing a thing for long enough when it comes to content creation and just the way that we as fans watch this sport and analyze the sport and talk about the sport and celebrate its highs and lows. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because we make up narratives in our head that make sense. We convince them that it makes sense. And then we, we, the narrative becomes the team should do X and that sets our own personal expectation level. And if they don't do that, everyone calls into the local radio station screaming about how our GM's an idiot and he did this wrong and that wrong and he's terrible. And you go, guys, he's the most successful GM we've ever had. He seems to have a pretty good handle on what he's doing in building an NFL roster year over year over year. So if he, in less than two seconds, can say, nah, trading up's a bad idea. I don't even have enough picks now. I gotta go get more picks, not fewer. Where were all the smart people on that one, Chris? All the people who go, no, I know what the Bills need to do. Do you? Because the guy at the helm does not see it that way. Just as he thought. (laughs) It's just as we thought. (laughs) It's the worst draft season trope of all time. Just as we thought or just as we predicted. Just as I predicted. (laughs) Just as I predicted, Drew is getting hammered on whiskey on a podcast. There you go. There's a place to start if you want to feel like a winner. Start with that one. And since we're talking about me getting bombed on $65 whiskey over here, we have to talk about what else is in the news that I think you people are overanalyzing to death. Josh Allen, drunk at Dawson Knox's wedding, singing an awful song. Chris, you're you're, you're more of a music aficionado than I am. Like To kind of underscore that, you know what I was doing last night? I sat down and was trying to do podcast prep. And instead, that turned into me drinking revolvers, which, for those of you who don't know, is coffee liqueur, orange bitters, and bourbon. Three-ingredient cocktail. It's almost like a Manhattan, except different. And you make that in a glass, and you drink it. And it tastes really good, and there's a little kick of caffeine in there because of the coffee liqueur, which helps keep you up at night. So then one cocktail turns into four cocktails, turns into you in your basement bar listening to Rainbow in the Dark by Dio at like full volume I think like six or seven times (laughs) that's what I was doing instead of podcast prep I I got home from that violin just hits so hard (laughs) I got home from North Carolina first thing that I did after like unpacking the car came down here and I ripped the new Star Set song that came out on Friday. It was the first thing I did when I got home. So, being the music aficionado, Mr. Brightside has to be one of the worst songs written, and yet everyone loves it, and I don't understand why. Not a fan. Okay. But I do get the... There are times when I can listen to a song, and I don't like it. But I can also hear how it can be perceived as catchy. And that's about all you get from Mr. Brightside. It's very catchy. I think the lyric the lyrics are I don't know. They're they were written to be sung along to, which I guess is what you do at a wedding. The what's a song you've ever gotten drunk and sung to at a wedding? Um I'm not sure I've ever done that. I think the shout song, the correct okay. shout song, okay, which is the Bills shout song. It's mm-hmm. the only shout song that should be ever played at a wedding. Greg with, Trelone does a great job of blending the real, like the Isley Brothers, with the Bill shout song. Greg Trelone from Toy Bros. Request it if you don't. If you want to see it in person, request Greg Trelone from Toy Bros. Uh, DJ. Yeah, he DJed a wedding I was at before I went to North Carolina. Uh, I can't remember hearing that shout song played because I would have been on the dance floor if mm-hmm. I had heard that. But that's like the only thing I'm going to sing at, at a wedding is if it is the Bills shout song. Take Me Home Tonight. Okay. Eddie Money. By Eddie Money. Uh, 
living on a prayer, even though we, I know how people feel about Bon Jovi, living on a prayer is a like a, a drunken sing along kind of a like that's a good one, right? Yes. I'm trying to think what else. What's another good? I don't know, but I don't understand what they're doing with Mr. Brightside. I think that that's dumb, and it it's worse coming out of the mouths of football players hammered at a wedding. But what's worse than that is fan reaction to a football player just living his best life, getting hammered at a wedding. Now, here's the funny thing. No one's mad at Dawson Knox for being drunk at his wedding. No one's mad at the other players who are involved. They're mad at Josh Allen. Because he's the head of the... He's like the CEO of the football team. He's got to have... He's got to be on his best behavior at all times. Says who? He's not allowed to have fun. Here's what I love. The NFL, right, is a job. And anybody who sits down, you know, we earlier tonight we recorded a podcast with the guys over at Witty Not Funny for the uh Built in Buffalo Network. We we I did a guest host spot over there on their show and we talked about this subject and I, I kind of made the point that you <laughs> were kind of hypocrites, right? Like anybody who looks at that and they're like, well, no, he's not trying hard enough. Oh, that's our quarterback. He, he should be working harder. He should be more focused. Focus on what? You want him to be the next Todd Marinovich? No, I need to eat, breathe, eat, breathe and sleep football. Why? So you can implode when things don't go your way? When you run into a little adversity and you realize you've made your entire existence about a thing where... One dude fumbling a football or some idiot defensive coordinator choosing not to press guys with 13 seconds left on the clock can lead to you not going to the Super Bowl that year. Like, it'll destroy you mentally. I would rather have a quarterback who can be that guy. Who can be that guy who's just a dude away from the game of football. And yet when he's on a football field can be the Terminator. I'm okay with that. I'm more than okay with allowing Josh Allen to be whoever the hell he wants to be away from the game of football. It, my favorite was, remember when that random lady like tried attacking him on social media because they were like, oh, he didn't hold the door for his for his girl and he walked in front of her and like ran into the hotel and didn't like wait for the paparazzi and didn't walk with her, blah, 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 blah. And then tried to make it a whole thought piece about how he's misogynistic and he's this and he's that. And he came back and just tweeted out. He goes, yeah, I ripped my pants at the restaurant. I didn't want to talk to the proper paparazzi like that. Sorry. I date hot chicks. (laughs) Sorry. I date hot famous chicks. I don't know what you want from me. Not only that, but sorry. I date hot famous chicks and I'm just a dude. I'm just a dude who tears his pants in public. When's the last time you ripped your pants in public? I'm not sure that I've... That you've ever had it? No. No, I can't think of think of uh, ever ripping my pants in public. Have we gotten a report on the wedding this past weekend? Blake Ferguson got married this past weekend, so did Reed get drunk at his, at his brother's wedding? I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I can't picture Reed. The guy doesn't swear. I can't imagine him getting hammered. Who knows? You'll have to talk to him in the next uh, Q42 meeting. He might get bombed and throw out an aw shucks. <laughs> <laughs> an oh fudge, like in uh, Christmas Story. Yeah. Guys, at the end of the day, football players used to smoke. On the, Ken Stabler and Jack Lambert used to smoke in the locker rooms and on the sidelines. Like, What are we talking about? This guy takes his job and his physical fitness and everything very seriously. Can't have one night to go get drunk at a wedding? If you can't be Josh Allen away from this, this guy that he is between the lines, if he can't be this guy, then I kind of don't want him. That's not true. I'll take him being this guy and just being whoever the hell he would be. But I think it's best that he's this guy. Because it does make him more accessible. You look at the way his teammates just kind of take to him. He's he's just the guy, and he's the leader, and he's the... And I think that's what helps him, is that he's able... They're able to see him like, oh, Josh is bombed at this wedding. 
But when it's go time, we know we can trust him because we trust him here. We see he's one of us here. He's definitely one of us out here and he leads by example. Also, I think back to the Doug Stanhope bit where he talks about people and their sober good times. And I see that version of Josh and I go, he's one of, he's one of us. Yes. Doug Stanhope is a whole thing about people who like how brave they are to try to have a sober good time. And I, I've never felt a comedy bit more in my entire life than that. He's talking about how if you try to go out and have a dinner, you're, he goes, do you know how the stars have to align for you to have a sober good time? Everyone has to show up on time. Your buddy's wife who talks too much can't dominate the conversation. The waitress can't have an attitude problem. The cook can't be fighting with his wife and having an off day. Every single thing has to align for your night to go well. He goes, meanwhile, I just pour booze all over all the mundane shit that I'm doing, and it becomes fun. My life rules. You get to watch Josh Allen bombed in public just doing, like, at a wedding, just doing that. He's having the best time. Anybody who thinks that that's a, oh, he's not, this is why we're not going to win. Him being hammered at a wedding is not going to be the reason that you don't win a Super Bowl. Hell, you could argue that if the Buffalo Bills of 1990, Chris, in Miami. Yeah. If they hadn't been out. Because you know that like that came up, that's come up over the years. That nobody party, you know. Everyone talks about nobody circles the wagons like the Buffalo Bills. Nobody partied like the 1990s Buffalo Bills, specifically Jimbo. Nobody partied like those guys apparently, especially Super Bowl weeks. So if the night before the Super Bowl, that those guys aren't out, a little Colombian rowdy powder allegedly. A little bit of uh, drinking, a little bit of sneak, hookery, a little, a little bit of sneaking around, what have you? Allegedly, you if you didn't have that, maybe we might have a Lombardi, and none of this is a problem. We don't have this looming specter, this grim thing hanging over our franchise. I would rather have a guy who just goes out and does it, and gets it out of his system. And then can just turn it on when I need him to weeks one through 20. Okay. That's the way I see it. And you're never going to convince me of anything different. I am happy that I get to see that version of Josh because it reaffirms that that dude is out there just living, cutting it. He's doing what you should be doing with the off season. Get it out of your system now. Soak it up. Cause now it's, cause it's going to be time to work and you're going to have to shut that off. And I think that he does. I think it's safe to say. Do you remember on Kimmel when Brady chugged that beer in a world record time in the offseason? And then he was like, yes. oh, I'll I'll drink in the offseason. But, you know, August, August, August to the Super Bowl, I don't have a drop of alcohol at all. Yep. It's like, look, that's what it is to be at the top of the game. So you, if Josh was behaving like this during the season, he would look more like AVP instead of MVP candidate. <laughs> so with that said, I think this is much ado about nothing, but I am happy that I did get to see drunk Josh Allen. Like, yeah. That's cool. Here's why I think that a lot of things are going to be okay. Right? I think that a lot of things are going to be okay. There's a, There's a... There's an article out by Doug Farrar. <laughs> now, he, he, Chris, we're still blocked on Twitter. Yeah. I thought that Schofield was going to put in a good word for us. He's not. I don't remember ever interacting with Doug Farrar. You might have done something with his uh, mock drafts. He got a, did his final mock, and it was completely off base, and then you might have Come, might have heckled him. Might have heckled him on the internet. <laughs> Bill Barnwell, Richie Incognito, and uh, Doug Farrar. It's wild to be blocked by these people and go, I don't even use Twitter. I don't tweet. What do you want from me? Chris, do you ever notice that we can't get over the 6,000 follower count? We're in like 5,900, yeah. whatever. No, but doesn't what I, bother me at all. It doesn't bother me, but what I find funny about it is like, we'll get 
like we'll, all of a sudden like people will start following us out of nowhere and I'm like oh no they don't know they don't know yet no and then you'll watch that all just fall off the first time I get drunk and just decide to burn Twitter down <laughs> yeah there's uh, ebbs and flows to it especially during the season because you might tweet something while at the stadium and then people are like fuck yeah this guy gets it he gets it this is how what I'm feeling and then a couple <laughs> weeks later I say something say else something. wild and they go Whoa, wow I am yeah. not on that guy's back side. off I am not on that guy's team it's like no you shouldn't be I'm not on anybody's side because there's nobody on my side that was uh if you're if you're nerds out there you know where that came from so we're looking at the Buffalo Bills offense and you're going, well, it's Josh Allen and he's out there drinking and he's not being prepared, blah, 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 blah. He should be spending more time with his new receivers because he doesn't have, he has a whole new cast of characters and he doesn't have a legitimate number one. Guys, I feel like too much is being made of this. First of all, a lot of the guys who are on our roster, like you're in the NFL. I've watched them make plays. We're not... Drinking these, I am. No, you could take all those. I am done, especially whatever the hell was in that glass on the right. I'm telling you, I want to write a letter to that distillery and tell them I will. I will. I'll get the uh, American flag <clears throat> with the circle of stars that Betsy Ross sewed. I'll meet you at the Mason Dixon and I'll fight your whole staff hand to hand. I'll fight you. I'll fight your distillery to death if you try to ship that stuff up here to Buffalo. Doug Farrar writes an article talking about how not having a number one receiver for the Green Bay Packers was actually kind of their secret weapon last year. And he goes on to detail some really interesting statistics about the concept that they they were able to win with scheme. Because there was no one who you could predominantly predict they were going to try to run their offense through. And in that way, they could pick subsets of things and they could pick certain scenarios to use and feature certain players. And at the same time, once you started to try to bite on those tendencies, they did have other receivers they could just hit you with. And so it all came down to really the talent of the coordinator and the quarterback, more so than anything the wide receivers individually were doing. I find that highly interesting, Chris, because it's 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 a it's a very college football approach, isn't it? Yeah. College football, you watch like upsets happen in college football, specifically because you could have the best you could be Ohio State and have like who did they hit Oh, do you have the hiccups? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. You look like an idiot. <laughs> they, you could in college, if you look at Ohio State, they had what? I think it was, um, it was Marvin Harrison Jr. I saw a tweet and they like had NFL, Chris Olave, Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, who else that went to the NFL? I'll give it a goog. Oh, my God. It was like the 2021 or 2022 Ohio State roster. They had multiple NFL wide receivers, and yet they didn't win a national title. (laughs) You don't win just because you have the best talent. You win because you have talent, but also you have a scheme. And the scheme can either match up well or at least can be tweaked to pick on the deficiencies of an opponent. And that's what the Packers did last year. And when you read Doug Farrar's piece, which I've tweeted out over at Rock Pile Report on Twitter, if you want to go check it out, Chris will even put a link to it on our Instagram. I'll throw that over to you. If you're posting a clip of this video, you can put it out there. He, he has some really great metrics on how they were able to manipulate defenses and how they were able to get into different situations and feature different wide receivers. And that's what made them so dangerous. That's why they were able to beat the Dallas Cowboys and make that comeback. It was because there's no one they can just lock in on when you have a lead and say, well, 
It's like the Buffalo Bills with Stephon Diggs. We'll bracket him with a safety over the top and now force Josh Allen to try to drive the offense through someone else, knowing that Josh wants to go there but can't. So all the plays that were designed to have Stephon Diggs as the first read become harder because you either have to give it to somebody else who isn't used to running those routes or you have to just divest yourselves of them completely or you have to try to do it and deal with all of the coverage and still throw into it. Those guys? Yeah, what do we got here? So, uh, Mar- 21 Ohio State roster. 21. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., Chris Olave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, and Garrett Wilson. That's wild. That is a wild group, and they didn't win a national title there. <laughs> and they didn't win a national title with that wide receiver group. It's because scheme and then how you match up with your opponent that week is what's going to win you. And so it's how can you, as an offensive coordinator, vary your approach from one week to the next to get you over the hump. And they, in this piece, Doug Farrar goes on to talk about the Kansas City Chiefs and their approach last year with a terrible wide receiver room. How did they kind of stabilize themselves down the stretch to maintain their passing ability and maintain their scoring and maintain all of these things? Like, Mahomes had the NFL's most passing attempts with three tight ends on the field. (laughs) That was a choice. They said, listen, we're going to put three tight ends on the field. We have Jody Fortson. We have some other guys who we believe are decent tight ends. And we have Travis Kelsey, who's elite. You can't match up with all of them, and everything is a mismatch. You're going to have to skew what you had planned for defensive coverage. And now the advantage is on our side, because we've practiced this, and you have no idea what the hell to do right now. That's the type of stuff that the Buffalo Bills can get themselves into with this roster. And so I understand why someone would hand ring when they go, Oh, Stephon Diggs is gone. He left. And then who's going to be the guy? This is what I know. There's a lot of mindless blather that takes place, whether it's radio, whether it's podcasts, whether it's shit like this, this time of year, because nothing's happening and we're still in the run up to training camp. So nobody's doing like some people are doing positional previews. Some people are doing things. Hey, let's talk about storylines that we're looking at, which I'm assuming we're going to have to get to. Because there are things ahead of training camp that I am interested in talking about. Although, we're going to have Anthony Prohaska on in a week or two to do a show with us all about the shit that a live show. Talking about storylines that I couldn't give a fuck less about. Because that's where I'm at with all of this. I've been around long enough to see enough of these and figure out that not everything deserves airtime. Right? Yeah. So, with that in mind... I have zero appetite for most of what's being talked about out there. The zeitgeist, if you're looking for an SAT word. You talking about appetite? I don't even know what's going to come out of your mouth next, but I... I don't know. It's behind your computer. Oh, yes. Yes, exactly. Guys, Chris, usually we do cocktail reviews. Instead, Chris was nice enough to get me a bottle of Oconee Gold Jalapeno Small Batch Barbecue Sauce. And what I have here is what looks like a delicious corn salad. It's like a... My brother made it in North Carolina. Jess had to recreate it when we got home. Okay, so what I'm looking at here in this little bowl, because I'm going to taste test this barbecue sauce. Ooh. It's from Statham, Georgia. Ingredients, brown sugar is the first ingredient, yellow mustard, mustard seeds, salt, turmeric, paprika, natural flavors, ketchup. Okay. It's got the high fructose corn syrup, not something you'll find in Q42's uh, products, but I digress. I do like the heat that that throws. It's a picture of spicy mustard sauce. Now, this corn salad has what I believe is corn, red onion. There's a cheese in here, something that's binding everything together. Is that cojita cheese, or what is that? Goat cheese. Goat cheese, all right. Whatever it is, we're going to lather her up here, and we're going to give her a run. 
eating on a podcast is always great production, Chris. You know, we've got yes. lots of comments about how much people love when we do this. Oh. I don't care, just make ingredients and this. This stuff rules. I like this because it's a medium spice. It's not hot. Well, it says jalapeno on it. Mm-hmm. How hot are jalapenos supposed to be? No, but I like this because the sugar and the the sauce is thick. So if you were going to make a spicy sauce, it needs to be sweet and it needs to have a little body to it. It can't be thin where it just runs all over the place. This is nice. Woo-wee. Man, I'm going to get fat with this. Well, how about the fucking corn salad? The corn salad is really good. I'm trying to see what else is in here. There's some chopped herb of some kind, it looks like, in here. What are the it's ingredients of this? corn. Corn on the cob. I put it on the grill tonight. We had grilled salmon. Uh, there's grilled jalapeno, grilled red onion, and then goat cheese that binds everything together. Mm. And as I'm not one for uh, most vegetables and all salads... That is phenomenal. It's really good. And this barbecue sauce is awesome. Thank you very much, Chris. I got it at the local Ace in the Highlands. So, Iman has a gold one. <laughs> next time he comes over, or if I see him, I don't know when the next time I'll see him. If he comes over for a podcast, or maybe a home opener against the Cardinals. I'll tell you when you're going to see him, Chris, because we're going to be picking up Always sunny in South Buffalo. We're doing it. We launched a, a soft launched a couple episodes last year. Got some feedback. I did some testing and I finally learned how to record. Guys, we're gonna be we're gonna be honestly launching the Always Sunny in South Buffalo podcast here in the next week or two. Iman and I, my co-owner at Q42 Barbecue, talking about life, food, nonsense. You know, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the uh, current events, and just through the lens of the fact that we all grew up and kind of lived and have had formative experiences ha- take place inside of the, what do you want to call it? What would you say? Because if there was a place that reminds you of the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia, it's definitely South Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> and we've all lived there. You, Reed. Me, Bridget, Iman, we've all been there. I love it. I love it. Just keep an eye out for it, guys. It'll hit your podcast feeds here sometime in the next couple weeks. That's when you'll see Iman again. We may even come in here and do some video. Shoot it. We'll throw it up on the rock pile feed. I don't care. I'm just looking to get the. I'm looking to do something other than football, and here's why. Because I keep having to have these conversations. I want to talk about something other than football this time of year. Because I have to have these conversations. There's guys out there. Chris. People that we are friends with. Greg and Aaron. The guys who I download your shows out of solidarity. Because I like you guys. I want you to be successful the same way you do. You know, one hand watches the other. We don't listen to them all. Just the same way you download our show and don't listen to them. And it's okay. We, that's it, it, Chris, isn't that kind of just like a, like in this industry, it's kind of a common thing, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I'll subscribe and download your shows. I, I might listen to every third one, but it doesn't matter. Well, I'm the, doing it because I'm supporting you. The real promotion is the, the guest spots. Sure. There's a reason why no one's asked you on their show. But. 100%. <laughs> nor should they. I don't blame them. I don't blame them because I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go do the cover one post game show. Do you know what a bloodbath that would be? That would be better yet. Better yet. Let me go and try to talk about. Look, look, look at this. I've got a list. You want to go take analytics and projections of fancy 11 v 11 stats that can somehow pronounce that this guy who's a third stringer last year is going to be the savior of the team this year, or you want to argue about what a, well, what does a good stat line for this player look like? You're an idiot. Does the team perform or does it not? 
I've done this long enough that I realize those conversations don't matter. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not going to go on Twitter or be the salty Karen leaving messages on YouTube being like, oh, none of this conversation means because I don't feel anything when you talk. It's just noise. It's like the, like when I hear that kind of conversation, it's like the teachers and peanuts. And then the kids have a conversation and then the teacher starts talking again. I, I can't, I can't do it. Right. So this is what I do, right? Cause it's summer. It's summertime. I'm wrangling two hard nosed little toddlers who are hell on wheels, right? I'm fighting with a swimming pool every single week, trying to keep the, the damn algae out of it. And also try to keep from maiming myself in it. For those of you who don't know, two weeks ago I fell. I slammed my knee off the inside of the pool. My entire leg is now, well, I, I had like edema from the initial impact injury. My entire lower leg swell, swelled up. You had what? Edema, it's called. Oh. Not the band, Chris, from the early <laughs> 2000s. But Appreciate, don't play a hate, congratulate. <laughs> it was the, They were one of the worst bands of all time. I saw them in 2010. I bet you did, because you love crap music. And yet somehow even you don't like Mr. Brightside, so that should tell you how bad that song really is. Compression wraps, the whole nine. I was able to force a lot of the fluid out of it. My foot, before we started podcasting, Chris, maybe we'll throw up, we'll throw a graphic up. <laughs> I'll text you a picture you can throw up on the YouTube. My foot looks like a sausage in a casing right now. It feels like a water balloon. Every time I take a step, I can feel it rippling. It's disgusting. I hate that pool. And yet I'm locked in. I will fight that thing to death. For you know what? No. Nope. You're dug in. I'm dug in. And, I, and, and I'll, I'll never, never change. change. <laughs> like, and I'm just trying to get a tan while trying to keep my blood pressure down. That's what I'm doing this time of year. You know what I did today instead of prepping for this podcast? I spent three hours in the pool with my kids. It was a blast. I had like, like four or five beers. Made the wife a cocktail. We had the kids in the pool. Kids were having a blast. I taught taught Jack the fun of being thrown like 15 feet in the air. Until he pukes on you. <laughs> like, like I puked on Daryl Talley? Yeah. I'm living, man. I don't have time to sit here and argue about, well, here's, here's what defines a good season for this player. Who gives a fuck? Are they winning or losing? Right. And also, Chris, having a pool is like having a boat. You would rather be friends with the person who has it than own it yourself. 100%. Just keep that feather in your cap. Don't, and no matter how much money, well, like when Jess gets rich, don't let her buy a pool. You will be pool guy. You don't want that in your life. What about a hot tub? Hot tub's great. That's what I told my wife. When this pool, my pool, like this is it, Chris. I am living the dream right now. The North Collins dream. I live in a corner lot in West Seneca, New York, across in a nice neighborhood across the street from where my kids are going to go to elementary school. My bills are paid. I have no concerns. It's a gorgeous afternoon, and I am floating in an above-ground swimming pool, drinking Miller Lite, drinking Miller Lite in an above-ground swimming pool, and not even just an above-ground swimming pool, a 1989 kayak pool with its own deck. It's all aluminum, baby. And for some reason, these things are unkillable. You, This is an old school thing, and I couldn't be happier. I looked around and I go, I've made it. I'm like, the Je- this is like the Jeffersons. I'm, I made it to that deluxe apartment in the sky. Except you've never talked to your dad. <laughs> I had that thought today. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. If, like, Because I thought about I was like, what would Chris say right now if he could see me floating in this pool, just living my best life? He'd be like, oh, you're a peasant because it's an old above ground pool. And I go, yeah, but what he doesn't understand is I'm fucking happy. And I'm enjoying every second of this and no one can take that from me. 
I would rather do that than sit here and hash through all these conversations about analytics that don't matter. Here's what I'll tell you. You know what I did last night while I was drunk and listening to Dio? Okay? I re-watched. I re-watched the Bills-Miami Dolphins regular season finale. And you know what I saw in that football game? I saw everything that told me that we are going to be okay this season. And I don't have to do the analytics like Doug Farrar and so many other Buffalo Bills podcasts are going bending over backwards to try to manufacture right now. I'll tell you what I saw. I saw Stefan Diggs run a, like a, a sweep route or like a pitch out route on an RPO play that turned into just an absolute strike down the left sideline to Khalil Shakir. Huge game. And if the safety doesn't ride him out of bounds, he's gone. He's off to the races for a touchdown. I watched Dalton Kincaid match Stephon Diggs in targets and catches. Right? Now, impact, you could argue. You want to fight about it? Stephon Diggs did have that, like, underthrown ball that he slid to catch to set up the Dawson. I think it was the Dawson Knox touchdown. Put us firmly in the red zone. 100%. 100%. Not going to take away from him. It was a great play. But also, I watched Dalton Kincaid just make himself available again and again and again. And first down after first down after clutch first down. And then I watched the play where Diggs has an opportunity for one of the, 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 the play was schemed perfectly. The safety's bit where they needed to. Diggs has no cover over the top. And he can't run underneath a ball that Allen just hung out there just so it wouldn't get picked. And Diggs just couldn't get it. I saw that. I watched that happen. That was the theme of our season, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah. Diggs just a day late and a dollar short so many times after like week seven or eight. And you can argue that the change in offensive coordinator might have affected some of his usage and that it, oh, his numbers went down because we tried to spread the ball around more. There are just plays that you expect your wide receiver to make. I guarantee you it's plays like that that led to, like, when when you're Brandon Bean and you're sitting there in your office at 1030 at night on a Tuesday going, fuck, am I really going to trade Stephon Diggs? Am I really going to trade him away, give him what he wants, get him out of here? That's one of those plays you go back and you watch and you go, I want a guy who's at least going to (laughs) try. A guy who looks like when he gets overthrown on that route that he's actually trying to get to the ball. It's just frustrating. And I watched Dalton Kincaid have better yards after the catch and only three fewer yards than Stephon Diggs. How about Dawson Knox being Josh's first read in the red zone in the game-winning touchdown, Chris? I like it. These are the things that you need to pick up on if you're going to understand where we are as an offense with all of these differing parts, all these moving pieces compared to last year. Like, in a game without Gabe Davis... And for a team that kind of had figured out by week 18, Deontay Hardy is, isn't worth a damn on offense. <laughs> He's just, there's nothing here he can do. They still had a dynamic passing attack that if it wasn't for a couple really, really bad Josh Allen turnovers, Chris, they blow them out on the road. Yeah. Even if they just kick field goals on those red zone turnovers, what, we had three of them? Three picks, two picks and a fumble is what they had. I think it was all inside the 30-yard line. Even if you just kick field goals, you had nine points onto what the final score was, Chris. You have a whole different game, don't you? Yeah. And that's on the road in a must-win football game for your opponent. You have a blowout. You have a blowout. So with that in mind, I don't know. It's like... How much more complicated do you guys want this to be? You go, well, well, but this has to happen, and we need this role, and we need that. They need whatever the offensive coordinator decides they need in order to run the plays. Now, the plays are up to him. Do you want to do 
what the like, like do you want to be what the Kansas City Chiefs decided to be last year? Do you want to try to be the team that's going to out scheme and say, hey, when you put certain personnel packages on the field, we're going to go three tight ends. And you're going to go, wait, what? The Bills can't go three tight ends. Chris, why can't we? Also, isn't Keon Coleman kind of just in that thing of like, hey, he's not a tight end, but if you're looking for a big physical wide receiver who's going to run block and also be a gross mismatch for linebackers and safeties, that sounds a lot like the job description of a tight end, isn't it? I mean, he's almost a tight end if he goes to Popeyes enough and Bojangles when he's in the offseason. What is he, Kelvin Benjamin? Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of things you can do schematically with the pieces we have to make yourself a very good offense. And I guess the thing that I'd end with is, do you know what else I've been doing with my time away from all this? I've just been hanging out with my kids. And I love it. I love every second of it. My son and I, and I had this thought when I was watching the Dolphins game. My son and I, I finally, like Chris, finally turned a corner. He's gotten, he's, he's starting to get into Transformers. Yeah. This is where things get fun. You know who his favorite is right now? No. Grimlock. <laughs> Grimlock the T-Rex <laughs> is his favorite Transformer. And I was like, I, I, first of all, I don't blame you. It's, it's cool. It's also a dinosaur, which is something you're familiar with as a child. He doesn't, he doesn't have like a, an affinity yet for any of the like standard Autobots. It's not the, and I know we're nerding out on the Bills podcast. Um, he doesn't have an affinity for the, uh, you know, hot rod, bumblebee, uh, iron hide. He, he doesn't, it's in jazz. He doesn't have any warm and fuzzy for those guys. And not even Optimus Prime. <clears throat> but that right there is what we have as the Buffalo Bills. And that's what makes us different than every team in our division. It's what makes us different than most teams in the AFC. And it makes, it makes us different than most teams in the NFL. Because when you think about all the hack premises, Chris, of a Transformers, like, let's talk about the like the, the, the TV series. Every episode, something's going to happen, but at the end of the day, regardless of what's going on, Optimus Prime finds a way to come out the other side of it as the winner, right? Yeah. He just manages the situation, sometimes just picks, just wills things to a victory for them for the Autobots that's what Josh Allen is for this team and there's nothing anyone can consistently do about it you might get the bills once in a while when's the last time a team has beaten us in back-to-back games do you know can't remember it's been a minute I would challenge I'll tell you what the first person to come up with it, I'll send you some swag from Q42. Tweet at us. When is the last time the Bills lost a back-to-back against a team? Can be an AFC East opponent, can be anybody. When's the last time we lost back-to-back? I'd like to know, with Josh Allen as our quarterback. The idea is you might get us once in a while. But this guy is just, he's a monster. And I get why people are doing all the mental gymnastics, right? Like, I get this. Because we are not as complete of a team on paper as so many of our corollaries in the conference. Or so many of our teams in the division. When you look at Miami, on paper, Miami seems like they have their, their house in order better than the Buffalo Bills, correct? Allegedly. Allegedly. When you look at the New York Jets, we don't know what, we don't even know where Aaron Rodgers is. Like, where is he? Aaron Rodgers, where is he right now? Ayahuasca. <laughs> that's not a place that's a drug, Chris. <laughs> Are you just saying, like, that's where he is mentally? Yeah. Just Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. 
on paper, they look like they can contend. On paper. Do you know what I, I've seen proven out in front of me? That we have a guy who, when individual plays to individual games to streaks of games break down, it doesn't matter whether it's through the air, it doesn't matter whether it's on the ground, we have a guy who puts on our jersey on Sundays, Mondays, and some Thursdays and just absolutely dominates our opponents. And there's nothing they can do about it. Third and 13 against the Miami Dolphins. And even they, like, had to know we're not stopped. <laughs> like, not only are they going to go for it on fourth down, but we probably can't stop Josh. And sure enough, what happened? He gets loose and he's running wild. Just running through the open field on them. It's it's oppressive. And it's impressive to watch. And so having done this for long enough and having the wherewithal to say I've watched that, I've tried to podcast through the days of the Tyrod Taylor stuff. And I've tried to podcast through the Nathan Peterman debacle. And I've tried to podcast through the early days of Josh Allen's career where he couldn't, because he was missing screen passes and 2019, he didn't look like a special passer. Do you remember when we were still having the conversation that Duck Hodges might be a better quarterback or a better passer than Josh Allen? That was the internet. Sure. The same internet that's out there today trying to, that's hand wringing over who's going to be our number one receiver? How many targets? What is, what stat lines are acceptable? It doesn't matter. They're going to put something together that's going to make them formidable. Because they've spent money in some places, and even the bit pieces they brought in that were cheap, they will find a job for them. What I go to in my head every time I start to doubt the direction of any of this, that Tampa Bay game. We play Tampa Bay, it's Tom Brady's Super Bowl season there, and... We go into that game and we play one of the worst first halves I think Josh played the entire season. And then we come out at halftime and just absolutely roll thunder on these guys. Like, let, let, Chris, can you do me a favor? Can you look up the box score for that game? I, I want to be sure of what I'm about to say. Go look 2022 Bills Tampa Bay Bucks Pro Football Reference. Because when I remember the game, what I can think of is me and Jeff Pollock yelling at each other. About it. Well, Jeff Pollock, not yelling, but like trying to talk me off ledge in my basement. And as we kind of go through, there, there we go. October 26th. Da, 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 da. Nope. Nope. Wrong one. Is that 2023? 2022. 22. Yep. Nope. 21. 21. I'll find it. Keep talking. Yeah. It was Bills at Tampa Bay. And it does sound right, 21. Because 2020 is when they won it. Fuck. Because you went to statistics. Hang on. Well, keep talking. Okay. So here's what I'm looking at. Tampa Bay comes in. They're running us out of the gym in the first half. And in the second half, Josh Allen almost single-handedly Brings us back. Chris, the year they won the Super Bowl. Go back. Yeah, there we go. Win in overtime. But look at that box score. So we scored three points in the first half. We were losing three to 24. 24 you hate it. to three. I, and see, guys, when I talk about how I do things just to antagonize people, you don't think that was intentional because I knew that it would irk him? That's good. That's good podcast. <laughs> And you know you can annoy people in the room with you and also at home. 24-3 to three at halftime. And then we come back and Josh Allen has an 18-yard touchdown rush. And then Dawson Knox catches a 15-yard touchdown pass. And then Gabe Davis catches a 4-yard touchdown pass. And then Tyler Bass just bangs home a 25-yarder that Josh set him up for with a bum ankle. Still kept pushing the offense to set him up for it and push the game to overtime. If I have that guy, 
then you can take all of this nonsense about expected stat lines and throw them out the window because I you you don't know when he's going to turn it on. And when he does, there's not a lot of teams. Chris, if that team doesn't have Tom Brady playing Tom Brady, hey, I can go out and win a Super Bowl caliber football, they prob- we probably beat Tampa in that game, don't we? Yeah. There's not a lot you can do because Josh papers over all of this. So when those of you out there hand-wringing about his preparedness and his readiness, not worried about that either. I'm not worried about any of this. I'll worry when the games get started. I'll worry when training camp starts and you tell me every receiver is dropping every pass. I'll worry when we're staring down the barrel of maybe not making the wild card. Now, I know that's a lie because I'm able to say that today because I'm here and there's no pressure and the Bills haven't lost three games to frustrating games to easy opponents. What I can tell you is this team is going to be fine and I don't need to do the mental gymnastics or the calculations. I don't need to get out a fucking whiteboard back here behind us and do long form algebra to try to prove to you that Dalton Kincaid is probably going to get 100 targets this year. Or that Khalil Shakir is going to need to be a bigger part of our offense if we're going to be successful. But also, to put a qualifier on that is pointless. Because you don't know what it is. You could have a whole season full of games like that Tampa Bay game. Where they start out slow in every single game. Because they're not talented at the pass catcher position. So defensive coordinators have schemes built to take away what they think the athletic profile of our wide receivers can accomplish. And then we, in the middle of a game, pivot from an offensive coordinating position, and our quarterback just goes nuclear on fucking people. The same way he's done to teams over and over and over again. You can all convince yourselves that these things matter. I'm going to keep floating in a kayak pool in my backyard, playing with my kids, drinking a bunch of beers, and just laughing about it all. You choose, You do whatever you want to do. <laughs> I love you just the same, but I can't follow you there. Chris, you're not worried, are you? No. Nor should you be. Especially not with hair like that. Your hair, this is actually like, Chris is having a good hair day. And that sounds weird saying it. Every day is a good hair day. This is the least offensive your hair has been in the last, like, two months we've been doing podcasts. So kudos to you. Guys... I'm looking forward to digging into training camp topics. I'm looking forward to all of this projection and conjecture going away. I love it. I can't wait to get back to football. How many weeks away are we, Chris? I don't know. Nine Sundays, I think. Eight Sundays. And for training camp to start, it's like three weeks. Yeah. We can do this. Let's pull together and get there in one piece. Until then, be on the lookout for Always Sunny in South Buffalo, airing on this channel, and eventually we'll probably branch off and post it elsewhere, although I may recruit Chris to uh, to help produce videos, just stuff. All right. I'm bad with with all all the stuff, Chris. I just got done singing all your praises on the witty, not funny sports podcast. Yeah. I got guys. You all know I'm a gorilla, and that Chris is the brains behind this entire thing. I can't wait to get back to real football talk. We're so close, but for tonight, we gotta get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger, and this has been your Rock Pile Report.